When I was uh, going to school in, well, my elementary school years, so a long time ago, don't remember much, but there's a few things I do. Uh, and one of them is one of the subjects I really hated in school. What was your uh, least favorite subject in school? Um, for me, it was um, history. I just really, I did not like U.S. history, specifically U.S. history. I didn't like it because I had to what? Memor I mean, if you don't like history, you probably, you would, understand, you would totally understand what I'm saying. I don't want to memorize all those dates, right? Like 1800, whatever, 1900, whatever. I can't remember the dates. And not only the dates, dates I can't remember the names, right? Names of dead, famous people that had passed long gone before historical events. I don't know. So for me, U.S. history has always been a big trouble for me because I have to memorize and my brain is not a very memorizing kind of brain. Well, think about it. When I thought about Abraham Lincoln, right, or people like Harriet Tubman, and you should know these people if you've lived here long enough, it seemed like, you know, growing up in the United States, I'm sure you can relate with me, it seemed like these people like Abraham Lincoln lived like thousands of years ago. No, you know what I'm saying? Like, it feels like that, doesn't it? It seems like they lived eons ago or whatever, long, long time ago. But when I refreshed my memory um, fairly recent ago, Harriet Tubman, she passed away in 1913. It's in the 1930s. I mean, that's not that far away. <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln died in 1865, and that, I mean, it is a long time ago, but it isn't as long as I imagine it to be. I feel like it's, they, they were in the, you know, in the medieval times or something like that, um, or like the biblical times. But the interesting thing that I find in myself, um, well, that I find myself being surprised every time I think of this is the fact that the United States of America is only 247 years old. That, that, that blows my mind. Doesn't it blow your mind if you think about it? I mean, I, maybe all of you know that, know that. I knew that too, but when I think about it, it's so young. <clears throat> right? United States is a very young country, uh, obviously dating from the independence in 1776. 247, only 247, 247 years old. And I have to remind myself that because it seemed like the U.S. has been around for much longer than that, Right? Like thousands of years, maybe. Yeah. So to talk about history and the traditions of the United States in comparison to, um, you know, China, right? That's like, it's not, you can't compare. How can you, China or England even, it, you just can't compare. It's, it's kind of like my, um, my son, I mean, he's 12 now, but when he was seven years old, he went to my father, his grandfather, and then he's like, Harabuji, do you remember Yennare? So he's like, do you remember a long time ago? It's like, you know, he's seven, he was seven at the time. How long ago could be a seven, or a seven year old, right? Do you remember that long time ago? So for my son, like two years ago is a long time ago at that time, right? But my grandfather it just, just feels like not even yesterday. It feels like today, you know, it's just how it is. It's funny. It's very cute to see that kind of um, uh, thing. But the reality is this. And this is what I'm trying to get at. It took only one generation. One gen okay, so for some of us, not even a one full generation. Some of us, it took a, uh, around one generation for us to call ourselves American. And I'm talking to those who, are, who have grown up in the immigrant church or immigrant families, okay? So I know not all of you are from the immigrant uh, family, but if you are, you totally can relate to this, right? And so for us to feel this like um, cultural gap, a generational gap, a social gap, a difference in tradition, and obviously for some, linguistic gap, right? Uh, our parents didn't speak English uh, as we grew up, and so between us and our immigrant parents, it was tough. Can you imagine, though, that if you have, you know, die-hard, loyal Americans of this country that is only 247 years old, die-hard Americans here, 247 years old, then how would you feel? How would you be like if your family had a history in a country for 430 years old? 430 I'm not just making that number up. You should know where I'm referring to. 430 years. I'm talking about the Bible, right? The Jewish people, the Hebrew people were in slavery for 430 years in another country in Egypt. Okay. Listen, one generation can change you into a loyal citizen of that country. I have second generation Korean American friends. I'm a second gen, by the way, if you don't know what I'm referring to. People who grew up here in the United States, but my parents came from Korea, right? So I have second generation Korean Americans who deny their ethnicity. They deny that they're Korean. They deny that they're tra their traditions. They're, they're, I'm American, right? That, that's all I am, right? Whatever that means, I don't know. 
Um, once again, my son, who's been in this world for well, 12 years now, but uh, already uh, when he was at that age seven, I remember he was telling me, he said, Dad, I don't want to speak Korean. I don't want to speak Korean anymore. And, uh, and he said that in Korean, right? And so I said, you will continue to speak in Korean, <laughs> period, right? Honestly, it's good for him, right? Those of us who speak multiple languages, you know that as you get older and as you're older and living in the world, it's quite beneficial, right? Uh, right? I'm trying to help my son out here, guys, <laughs> but you're not being helpful at all. It's true, though, okay? <laughs> He's, like, so embarrassed right now. He's like, oh, I can't believe this. All right. But listen, can you imagine uh, 430 years in one place, in one country? Listen, that environment is not only going to change you, that's who you are. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't change. That's who, 430 years doesn't change you. It's just who you are. That culture and it's all its traditions make up who you are. That's the food you're going to eat. That's the food that you will crave. That's the food that you're going to crave when you're away, right? Being homesick. That's what you know. 430 years in a country. And this isn't just on a national level. Like, yeah, nationally, we have, you know, America has certain traditions. Korea has their own culture. Every country has their own culture and tradition. But it's not just at a national level. Uh, you, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's down at the, 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 the community, right? It's down to the states. Every state has uh, its own kind of culture and tradition here in the United States, right? Communities have their own culture and tradition. Families have their own values and traditions within the nationality and the races and even within the church, right? They have their own culture. Some churches like to give coffee and donuts and some churches like to give rice and soup, right? And it's just uh, very different kind of cultures. Listen, your friend... Uh, group, your cliques that you're part of, your neighborhood where you grew up, that's going to change you and make you into who you are today. That's who you are today. The community that you belong to growing up, that's who you, that's who you are now, right? right? That's, what, that's how you think. That's what, that, yeah, that's who you are. What, listen, what you think to be good and what you think to be wrong, your values and the things that you live by, what you think is good in life, what you believe to be wrong in life, these are all from your environment, how you grew up. A lot of it is. I'm not going to say 100%, but a lot of it is. Your ideology, the way you're, uh, of your life, your belief systems that you have, it's going to be altered and shaped and molded according to the kind of people and environment that, you, that's, that are surrounding you. Now listen, that can be a good thing, and it can be a bad thing, right? Not all traditions are bad, and not all cultures are, uh, or values are wrong. There's good ones and there are bad ones. But here's the point. There are some things in life that we need to get rid of. Amen? There are some things in life that we need to get rid of. Amen? Right? There are things like that. There are things in life that we need to, as the Bible tells us, that we need to, the Bible tells us this, we need to kill. Yeah, I know it's a strong word. And I, some of you are like, <gasps> oh. yeah, it's a harsh word. But the Bible uses that word. There are things in our lives that we need to kill. Kill. Like I said, it's a strong word and maybe... Uh, I'm going to lower it down just a little bit because I'm going to be saying that word a lot if I just decide to do that. But um, just remember that the Bible uses that word to kill. The Bible uses the word to kill for things that are trying to kill us, right? Basically, the Bible is teaching us that we need to kill it before it kills us. And the name of censorship here for now, because we do have young children here, we're going to use the word like cut away. That's a little bit better, I think. Cut away or to leave behind. How about that? Okay, so to cut away our old habits, to cut away our old habits, our traditions and our routines in our lives, our old habits. Like, the obvious ones are like, you know, the big drug addictions and the alcohols and, and then a lot of other addictions that you have in your life that, um, that, I, that I don't even have to mention that I know that you might be going through, whatever it might be. Maybe it's the way you speak. It's not just the addiction. Maybe it's the way you, you talk or maybe the way you think or the way you live or how you think, how we act. There are things that we need to get rid of in our life. There are things that we need to filter out. There are things that we need to cut away. There are things we need to circumcise, as the Bible teaches us. And you know what? It's very hard to cut cold turkey. You know what that means, right? Cut cold turkey. Have you ever tried to cut cold turkey? Have you ever tried to cut frozen turkey? It's possible, but it's extremely difficult. Very, very hard. It's literally hard. Like, literally hard. <laughs> it's frozen. And so this cutting away, this leaving behind, many people would say cutting cold turkey is the best way. It is the best way, right? I, I agree if you can do that. People who are smoking cigarettes and they need to cut it, it, the best thing is to cut it now and that's done, right? But let's be honest, brothers and sisters, that's a miracle. 
right? That's what it is. And miracles don't happen every day. Miracles don't happen all the time. Getting rid of what you used to, getting rid of what comforts you, right? That's what it is. Things that you're used to, things that you need to get rid of, those things that you've been dependent on all your life, what used to bring you possibly temporary security, getting rid of what used to calm you, your security blanket, the blanket that you like, even if it's for a moment, right, the temporary relief, you know it's not good for you now. It's really hard to do it in an instant. It's really hard to cut those kind of things out of your life in an instant, especially if you're doing it for years. It's become your routine. It's your lifestyle. It's your tradition. It's become who you are, right? So cutting cold turkey is extremely hard. It really is. If anything, the Bible actually teaches us it's not just cutting turkey. It is, it's a process, that's what it really is. Cutting away is a process for us. The sanctification is a process. That's what we call it in theology. It's a sanctification process. That's what we call it, right? It's not a one-time deal like justification, if you know what I'm talking about. Sanctification is something that happens your whole entire life. It's, it's, it's the process of you becoming more like Jesus. The Holy Spirit is moving you and changing you so that you can become more like his son. That's what sanctification is. So, listen, if a ba when a baby is born... What do you have to do? You have to cut the cord, the umbilical cord. If you do not cut the umbilical cord, then that's a big problem, right? You need to cut the umbilical cord for this child. We have to have a time when we say that I will commit, I will cut it. You have to cut that when the child is born. But there's more to it than just cutting the cord. That's only the beginning of one's life. Now that you cut the lifeline off the baby, because that's what the baby was being fed through, the baby is now in a new environment, right? The baby needs to learn a new way of eating because no longer is the baby going to get receive the nourishments and nutrients through the cord. The baby needs to learn to use his or her mouth, needs to adjust to a new lifestyle. And so cutting away is a process. I remember a few years ago, I was pretending to give my newborn uh, baby uh, daughter not a few, it's been many more years than that now. She was, she was just born, and my wife was holding her, and I got a flaming hot Cheeto. <laughs> you think I did it? Of course not. Of course I wouldn't do it. You can't just begin to give newborn babies steak and sushi, right? Like, this just doesn't make sense. There is a process from this cutting away, from the umbilical cord and moving art. She lived in her, mom's, her mother's womb for 10 long months. Right? That she doesn't, that's all she knew. And all of a sudden, bam, a whole new world, right? Totally different world. She went from breast milk to mashed up, nasty food, baby food, and then to solid food, right? There's the process that people, all kids go to, go through. But here's the point. What used to give you life, the umbilical cord, is no longer useful when you were born. It was extremely useful when you were in your mother's womb. But now that you're out, you don't need that anymore. If anything, it might even become dangerous for you to have that umbilical cord attached to you all around. It's very unnatural. Brothers and sisters, we are called, the reason why I'm telling you this is, we are called, all of us, to move forward. We are called to grow. Imagine if your child stops growing. That's a terrible thing. God forbid that ever happens to any one of our children. But we are made to grow. We are made to grow. We are made to mature. Right? Isn't that so natural? Everything I'm saying is very obvious. Right? But if you're not moving forward, if you're not moving, if you decide, if you think you need to stay, if you choose to stick with your clique or your group and your friends, if you've given up and want to live the way you always lived and never want to have any changes in your life, listen, your friends and your cliques, they don't want you to change. Right? It's like, you know, if you go somewhere and you come back and your friend goes, man, you've changed a lot. That's usually a negative thing. Right? Your friends don't want you to change. Who else don't want you to change? Your addictions don't want you to change either. The things that you're addicted to in life, they don't want you to change. Right? They don't want you to move. But God, our God is the God of the moving. God is a moving God. Amen? God is a moving God. Our God is in the business of moving, actually. If you think about it, take a look at the Bible. I'm not making this up. Tell me who isn't moving in the Bible. Right? Adam and Eve were moving. They were moving. Noah was moving. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham left his hometown to move. 
Jacob was moving. Joseph was moving. Moses was moving. Every one of the characters in the Bible, they're moving, they're moving, moving. Listen, 430 years. 430 years of slavery in Egypt, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. God's people were moving from, after 430 years of slavery, from Egypt to what we know as the promised land. The land that God told them would be flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. God is a God of moving. He is a God of transitions in your life and in mine as well. He desires for you not to be stagnant. He desires for you to change. Amen? You do not want to be stagnant, brothers and sisters. He wants us to grow, mature, to become more like His Son, Jesus. He wants us to be free from the bondage of yesterday, the bondages of whatever life that you might have lived in your old life, and live the new life that you have in Christ. Amen. Right? Staying in one place for too long is not a good thing. Being stagnant becoming, is becoming too comfortable. Becoming too comfortable will get you to rely on what was always working in your life. You're not going to be searching and seeking for anything else. You're always going to rely on what you're always used to. Right? It will get you to depend on and to trust in, put all your heart and soul in whatever old method that you might have had. And that kind of thinking, that kind of lifestyle, way of living, is going to get you to build a bull. Getting to the point now. It's going to make you build a bull. And that bull that you're making isn't going anywhere. It's, it, it's going to stay right here where, where you are. And all it is cre creating in your life is a life, your life is, is a pile of bull poop. I can't say the other word. Right, Elder? He's like, you should just say it. Pultong, 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 that's good. We'll get you to build a bull. Think about it. You come to church... You sing your praise, you go to small group, you give your offering, you repeat. Every week is the same thing. It's your routine. You're doing the same thing again. You go, you go to church on Sundays, you praise, you go to small group, you give your offering. You do it again. Yet you wonder, why? what's going on? Why am I not having any changes in my life? It's just a repeated over and over, like I'm on a merry-go-round. Why, why isn't my life changing, God? All of our religious acts and all of our good deeds and all that we're giving... Listen, you might not be giving it to God. That's the problem. Think about this. We might not be giving it to God. The whole time, you might have been giving it to your bull. You might have been feeding your bull. The time you're going into a small group, the time you're offering praise, the time you're worshiping, all is just bull. The whole time. Moses, when he came down from the mountain... 40 days with the Lord at Mount Sinai. The people were wondering, what's going on? He comes down with the tablets in his arms. The Ten Commandments, he's coming down. He comes down, and what does he see? He sees the people dancing, dancing around a golden calf, a golden cow, a bull, right? And he says to Aaron, he comes down, he goes, hey man, I put you in charge. Okay, paraphrasing. What are you doing, Aaron? What is going on? Where did that, that golden bull come from? And this is what Aaron said. Listen to what he says. Exodus 32, verse 24. Exodus 32, verse 24. He says this, and I quote this, and, and I say this because it's just so funny what he says. So I said, this is what he said. Moses, so I said to the people, let any who have gold to take it off. So, that, so they gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, and out came the bull. That was the response. I put it in the fire, and out came the bull. Like, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> like, it just appeared, Moses. We offered our offerings to God our gold to God, and out came this calf. Aaron, that's bull. Come on, guys. Let's do it. You know, you know let's respond, right? Wasn't that what? Okay, never mind. Where did, <laughs> where did this cow, cow, cow come from? Right? I didn't teach them to build a bull. I didn't teach them to build a bull. The Hebrew people in his history never worshipped a bull. Where did they get this idea from? Where did you get this idea, Aaron? Moses could not understand them. He couldn't understand what's going on. This is crazy. Listen, the reason why I'm saying this is because people will not understand your bull. They won't. They're not going to understand your bull. Society, when they find out about your bull that, you're, that you've been hiding, the bull that you, the, the idol bull that you've been hiding, when you pull that out, society's going to point the finger at you. They're going to judge you. Your parents and your family might even disown you. That's the bull I'm talking about, the bull, when they see your bull. Listen, but God knows where that bull came from. He knows. God knows your bull. 
He knows cutting cold turkey is extremely, extremely difficult. He knows that it's a process. That's why it's called a sanctification process by the Holy Spirit. And that is why after 430 years in Egypt, 30 years of peace with Joseph, which is true, and then 400 years of slavery thereafter, God knew that it isn't simply taking them out of their environment, although he did, that's going to change them. It's not just simply taking them out. He knows that it isn't just a physical change that they need. Listen, I know this because you know this. Remember I told you I was a drug addict or I am a drug addict and I had to go to Korea. He took me out of the environment of where I was at. But that's not everything. That's just half the story. You and I know that the physical change is simple. Just moving the body to another. The problem is mental change. The problem is heart change. That's the hard part. It might be easy for us, like my wife and my kids and us, we all moved from Virginia. We lived there for nine years. We moved over to uh, Philadelphia. That wasn't easy. It, yeah, moving our stuff is easy, right? Just move from there to here. It's physically hard, but it's easy. What's hot easy is our heart, right? My wife has friends in Virginia who she's not able to see anymore. My children have friends, and they have friends at school that they're not able to see anymore. So it's an extremely difficult time for them. Right? All because the, their dad wants to come here. Right? <laughs> it's not easy. It's really hard for us to change our mind. They say, they say that the farthest distance, what's the farthest distance in this world? Do you know? The farthest distance in this world is 18 inches. Yes. I saw someone, someone do it. Right? It's from the head to the heart. That's the farthest distance. It's extremely difficult to change one's heart. And that is why when God sent, okay, listen to this carefully, when God sent the destroyer, the spirit of death throughout Egypt, and the Hebrew people, what did, they, what did he instruct them to do? To paint the blood of the lamb over their doorposts, right? To paint the door, blood over the doorposts. And so if the, when, when, the, the, when the spirit of death passes by, will pass by the houses that have blood over the doors. So once that happened, what happened? He took his people, though those who have obeyed God's command to put the blood over their doors, he took his people out of the 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and then what did he do? Through the Red Sea. How? On a boat? No, you know the story. How? He split it. Split the Red Sea. They walked on dry ground, which, uh, which we, uh, uh, you know, amazing, right? It's, this is a miracle. miracle. And so what this really is, is what? Death, burial, well, it's baptism. Okay, so we're seeing here this huge crowd of God's people leaving uh, Egypt is a massive uh, baptismal service. And so they finally get across. Listen to this. They finally, they are no longer slaves, right? Because they were saved, right? They were washed by the, they had the blood that saved them from the spirit of death. And then they went through the Red Sea, which is baptism, right? So now they are no longer slaves. They are what? S just like you and me. They are sons and daughters of God. That's what happened. Saved by the blood, washed by water baptism. They are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. They are li now living a new life. They are in a new location, a new opportunity, but they still have their old ways and old mentality. 430 years of living in Egypt, 400 years as slaves, it's going to make you who you are. You can't avoid that. You might look like a Hebrew, you might look like a Korean, or whatever you are, but the way you think, the way you act, you're going to think like an American, because you lived here so long. These people, they're going to think like an Egyptian. That's all they know. And God knows that. He's not ignorant to that. That is why he says to you and me, you got to listen to this carefully because it's a message for all of us. This is what he says. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, verse 2. If you don't know it, write it down, go home, and meditate on it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 makes it should change your life. He knows that this is a process. That's what he's saying in that verse. It's got to it's got to start somewhere, is what he's saying. And so when the Hebrew people finally got across the Red Sea, if you remember the story, and their slave master Pharaoh, 
was drowned. The, 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 the Egyptian army were drowned into the Red Sea. No longer are they slaves now. They've crossed over. They're set free. They're free now. It's as if they just cut cold turkey. If you remember what happens when they're there, they, Miriam comes out with tambourines and she's singing songs and dancing. Moses begins to celebrate because of the victory. The entire Hebrew people were shouting praise and victory. It's just like a newborn child coming into the world as a, a whole new world, a baby what? Cries, right? Shouts, same thing. We're seeing a new life, a born-again life here right now, a new place. All right, what do you, now here's the thing. 400 years, 430 years of being in Egypt, 400 years of slavery. What do you do now that you're free? Freedom is a beautiful thing. Freedom is a great thing. We have freedom in this country. We take for granted of the freedom in this country. But for slaves of 400 years, freedom can be a frightening thing. It could be an extremely scary thing. For all your life, you've been told what to wear. You've been told what to eat, told what to do. Your schedule is planned out, when to sleep, when to wake up. You have no choices or options. You have no freedom. You have been a bondage all your life. But then all of a sudden, you cross over the Red Sea, you have this freedom, what do you do with it? And this is a crucial moment in your life. It is like sending your child off to college. It really is. I remember when I left for school, I lived um, uh, three, my school was three hours away from Chicago. I went to University of Illinois, so it's about a three hour drive. When I was going, I was extremely excited. Freedom, right? From a very oppressive Korean mom and dad, parents, right? Asian parents, tiger moms, right? Whatever you call them. I'm like, freedom! But as I am doing that, my heart is scared, right? There's a little fear there, the fear of the unknown. You've never been free. I've never been free. So that's what I'm trying, that's what's happening here, right? It's a crucial moment in their life. It's like cutting the umbilical cord. That's what's happening. You are now free from the womb, right? But what do you do with this freedom? You've been washed by the blood, washed by the blood and water, went through the birth canal, and out come into this new life. You celebrate by giving a cry like a newborn child, and now you begin the process of sanctification, the process of growth, the process of leaving behind and cutting away. That's what we're doing today. And moving forward into that new position that God has for you and me into this new life. And as the people of God moved on into the wilderness, they finally get to Mount Sinai. I'm just telling you the narr narrative. And they were, there they were told that they were going to meet God for the first time. Actually meet Him. But in the midst of their impatience and lack of faith, they decided to build a bull. Build a God. And just as we heard earlier, Aaron said that they threw in the gold and out came a calf. Where did this bull come from? It came from Egypt. Right? That's where it came from. Egyptians worship bulls. You can go ahead and Google it. Egyptians worship bulls. In the midst of their freedom, these people, freedom, they only did what they knew. Think about that, right? They only did what they knew. As they say, you can take a man out of the ghetto, but you can't take the ghetto out of the man. Right? We say that. It's true. The Hebrew people took the wealth of Egypt out and offered it to what they thought was their God, and out came a bull. It's just bull nonsense. That is the product of what is in our minds, brothers and sisters. That is the product of what is in our lives. were full of bull. As I say, they had the wealth of the master, but a mentality of a slave. That's what we see here. And are we living that way today? The wealth of the master, our Lord and Savior, but we live like slaves. That's our mentality issues. In the very presence of God, right in His face, right at the feet of Mount Sinai, they built the bull. Right in front of His face. Moses asked, what did they do with all, what did you do with all the money that we gathered from Egypt? Aaron said, I don't know. The bull got it. Where's your money? The bull got it? Where's your time? The bull got it. You're full of bull. 
Have you been feeding your bull? And you know what? We've been doing it right in God's face. Right at the, at the foot of Mount Sinai. We're right here, sitting here, right in his face. So Moses took the Ten Commandments, the two tablets, he threw it out of his hands, and he broke them at the foot of the mountain. That's what happened. He got so mad, he took what God wrote with his own finger, God. He took the tablet, just threw it down and broke it. And that tells me something important. That no one, not you, not me, no one in history, will be declared righteous in God's sight by the law. No one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, Romans 3.20. Why? Because we broke it before we even got it. Do you see it? We broke it before we even got it. But God knew that this is a process, that your process and mine. He knew that this is a time of transition. A new senior pastor is here. It's a new time of transition right now for our church. And so what follows is God giving his people rules and regulations, rules and laws, so that his people would know what he wants. They lived in Egypt for so long, they don't know. So now he has to let them know. See how logical it is, what God is doing? It's very logical, right? He, he's telling them, this is what I want. This is what you need to do to live an abundant life. This is what's going to bring you true joy. This is what's going to bring you true peace. This is what's going to bring me happiness of how you live. That's what he's doing. He's making a nation. He's making a people. He's creating culture, a kingdom culture. A way of life for his people, for us today as well. And in the midst of these rules and ordinances, God tells them something very interesting. He says, this is, look, this is the final point and we're done. So after he gives the word, or after he gives the law, the regulations and rules, what he does is our passage today. That's what I wanted to read today. What does he, what does he do? He says, after giving the law, he says, bring me a bull before the tent of the meeting. Bring me a bull before the tent of meeting. That bull represents the trespasses, the sins of our lives. That bull is the product of our sins. He tells Aaron and his sons to lay their hands on the bull, on the head of the bull. What are they doing? Lay your hand on the head of the bull. They're transferring their sin, their trespasses. They're transferring it. That bull, what is that? That bull is representing your sin and mine, their sins. That bull is the product of our sins. That bull is bad tradition. That bull is bad habits of your life. And when you bring the bull to me, God says, when you bring the bull into my presence, when you bring the bull before the Lord, kill the bull. I'm going to put it another way. Do not try to kill the bull on your own. How many of you have... I mean, I don't know. If you're a smoker, how many of you tried for so long to try to quit smoking cigarettes on your own? It's extremely difficult. Don't try to kill the bull on your own. Don't try to hide the bull away. Because I know, God says. He knows. He can see it. You might be able to deceive the people around you, your family, your husband or wife, but you can't deceive the Lord. He sees the bull. Don't leave the bull outside when you come wait, wait, don't, don't leave the bull outside when you come to worship how many of you are doing this right now did you have to come into the church acting holy and righteous I hope you didn't you got to bring your bull into the church amen you got to bring your burden into the church bring it before the cross stop leaving it at home so after church you go back home and you pick up the burden again that's bull nonsense that's the bull we're talking about. Don't leave your burden and sins at the door and coming into the church acting like you're righteous. Bring it all in here and burn the bull. Kill the bull before God. Amen? And when you go back home, you're going to go back home refreshed. You're not going to go back home with your problems. God says to bring the bull to me. We're having a barbecue party today. My daughter's dancing right now. Do you smell that? <laughs> Someone's burning the bull right now. Burn 
your pool. I'm not telling you to burn it tomorrow. Now, as you're listening. God cre is creating this culture. He's building this nation. He's building this church. Brand new, 55 years of history, great, that's fine. We, we, we respect our founding fathers. We respect those who have gone uh, for 55 years and made it to be where it is today. Thank you. But we can't, we can't live in the past. we got to move forward. God is a moving God. Amen? God is a moving forward God. we got to get rid of the bull. We see here the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places. By the high priest as a sacrifice of sin, they're burned outside the camp. We've read that in our passage today. So, what did Jesus do? Jesus also suffered outside the camp, right? Outside in the gate, in, 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 in the gate, in order to sanctify the people through His own blood. And that's why the Bible tells us, therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We are moving is what he's saying. We are going to see Jesus. So through Jesus then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, the Bible teaches us. Brothers and sisters, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine. Just think about that. In Exodus, they had to kill the lamb for the blood to be over their house so that those who were in the house were saved. It's the same concept in the New Testament today, in our era now. Jesus died on the cross, and those who believe in that blood will be saved, not only today, but for eternity. And so now that you've been saved, we are on our road, our process of sanctification to become more like Jesus. We're continuing to move, continuing to grow. Last Sunday's message was all about growth, remember? And as we offer up our bull, offer up our idols, offer up the things in our hearts before God, not hide it at home, not try to figure it out oh, somewhere else. When we offer it, people might not be able to understand you. Society might be pointing the finger at you. Your own, own family might disown you. But God knows you're a bull. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. That is who you are. Listen, that's why he sent his son, Jesus. You can't quit that drug. You can't quit the smoking. You can't quit the habits. You can't quit the bad things in your life. Bring it to God. That's why he died on the cross for you. Some of you are looking at me right now. I can see you're so interested. But you haven't crossed over yet. I can see that. Let me say it again. Bring your bull before the Lord. Accept Christ as your Lord and Savior in your heart today. Brothers and sisters, Romans 12 verse 2, I'm just going to say that and we're going to end it today. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. Testing, discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable and perfect. Let's pray.